ancestors had never something your ancestors had never known to humble and test you that in the end might go well with you you may say to yourself my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me but remember the lord your god for it is he who gives you ability to produce wealth and so conf- confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today and my message uh, i i decided to to name my message and, and and I wanted to call it remember and 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 I thought it would be cool to just take a minute to remember what God's already done remember what he, the blessings that he's already given you the blessings that that I don't know whatever it is you know in your heart what God has given you in your life what God has done for you in your life already and I thought it would be cool to just take a minute as I pray and as the um, host team pass the containers we'll pray and just as I pray just reflect on something that you're that you're grateful for that you're that you're um, that you feel blessed by God so thank you God thank you God for the blessings you've already given us and we are grateful we are grateful we are grateful for you God we're grateful for you. We're grateful for the, the ability to, to work, the ability to create finances and, and, and the ability to have family and a church, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. 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 Cool. I had one, one more thing. and Can everyone say jam-packed July? Oh, come on. Now, I've lost my card, but I found it again. So, so Jam Pack July, we're going to have Dave Edgar coming for a whole weekend. We're going to do like a, yeah, come on, come on. Yes, he's a legend. I have met him a few times and he's so good. He's just gold. He is gold. He's proper gold. Um, team night, we have a team night coming up in the next next bit in July. Um, more info on these things, find it on our social media, our uh, thing that gets sent out newsletter that's the word that's the word newsletter and <laughs> oh, hey I'm, I'm learning I'm learning <laughs> but I'm having fun I'm having fun learning so cool so that was the, the last thing jam packed July if you want more info on what's happening um, definitely just check out social media check out the newsletter check out um, yeah anything you'll find it you'll find it if you if you want it cool hey let's stand up let's stand and uh, welcome our awesome senior pastor pastor andrew to give us the message sammy wow thank you everybody stay standing just for a moment um holy spirit's here it's been evident this morning and it's mornings like this you just don't know as a pastor exactly what to do. Sometimes it's better just to get out of the way. But I think God wants me to preach the Word. That's so all we do is we come around. The part of our, our worship is to actually come around the Word. And we're going to come around the Word this morning. But I just want us just to... Can we do something just... Different? we all just close our eyes and just lift up our hands to Jesus and just ask him you don't have to you can do it out loud you can do it in your head but say Lord I need you come I'm ready I'm willing and I need you to speak to me I need you to speak to me. Just keep your hands lifted. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome here.
Lord, we just pray for the rest of this service that you would have your way. You continue to move here in people's living rooms, in Neil. Your presence would be felt, it would be real, like it is in this room here this morning. We pray that you have your way in our hearts today as we seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we take a seat? All right. A couple of things we need to do. Thank you, worship team. Oh my gosh. Can we? They don't ever want us to clap. But they don't ever want us to clap. They don't want the accolades. They keep telling me off. But I think this morning we should give our worship team a huge round of applause for being sensitive to God's truth. We're going to continue on with Jesus is in just a moment. But before that, I just feel like I've, there's a couple of things to do. Is that okay? Where's, where's Sherilyn? Sherilyn, I had you on my heart all morning. Sorry, I do this. Just to explain, I kind of cry when I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to say something. So just bear with me. It'll, it'll come good. I've just had you on my heart. And you and Pastor John, faithful servants for decades. You've done what the Lord has wanted you to do. And for Cheryl and I, I really sense that there's, there's ministry in you that hasn't come out yet. That it's been there and you've been stepping into it and you've been... You've kind of like, kind of sometimes hit a ceiling or a cap out of submission or out of honor and respect. But I really feel that for you, that God's got something specific for you to speak into and to to say specifically. And and I don't know what it looks like, I don't know how, but I've just had you on my heart all morning during worship. And I really feel like God's got something new. That he, he wants, that you've got an anointing on your life and that is evident in the way that you speak and you pray and the way that you, you deal with people. But I really feel like it's time to, let, it's, it's time to actually let that shine. And the, the, there's, there's, there's going to be a, a coming out of a shadow and you're going to shine in that. And can, can we just sort of stretch forward our hands to Cheryl and right now? Father, let your anointing fall. Let your fire fall right now in the name of Jesus. Let your word become true and evident in her life. In Jesus' name. Let, your, let the Holy Spirit come. The spirit of prophecy come in Jesus' name. That it would strengthen and grow and be bold and courageous. We pray over her right now in Jesus' name. That the ministry that you have birthed in her will start to continue to develop, Lord God, and impact so many more lives that we would not think possible. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lady, write a flipping song already, please. This is not, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord or anything like that. But seriously, you need to do this. God has gifted you. He has anointed you. You have got a spirit of worship in your heart. Please write some songs. We'll record it. We'll work it out. We'll put it on YouTube or something, but it needs you, this, that worship needs to come out. We've got that on record this morning. Take that home. Get it worked that through. Mountains have to move. All right. Let's, let's preach. <laughs> We're going to preach. We're going to get into the Word of God today, and I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Timothy, chapter 2. We're going to get into the book of Timothy chapter 2. Actually, we're going to get into a lot of scripture. If you don't know me already, my name is Pastor Andrew and I am renowned for having lots of scripture verses because I feel like the Bible sometimes speaks for itself and if I can just articulate it and get out of its way a little bit, it's going to speak to you more than what I could actually ever speak to. I don't have any funny stories or silly illustrations that could ever articulate the Word of God in the way that God designed it out of this book. All right, It is the best thing. Now, if I can just get that into you, which is what my job is, I will try that. But today, I'm I'm grateful for Jesus. Jesus, we've been looking at the the ministry of Jesus. We've been looking at how um, he has had an impact on the world in the physical, in the the natural. We looked at last week his role as the teacher, his role as 
as uh, I don't even remember all the points from last week. Someone will tell me after the service. Um, but Jesus is the Saviour. And I want to make that very abundantly clear that Jesus is not a Saviour, but Jesus is the Saviour. You can't go, well, there's many different ways to get to heaven, like all, all roads lead to Rome. No, they don't. The Bible clearly says, and Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You, you can't have go, well, that's just one pass to get to eternity. And I might try this other thing over here. This, I might try a bit of Buddhism or I might try some, some transcendental meditation or some Hinduism or some you know, new age kind of philosophy. No, there is no philosophy that can take away from what Christ did on the cross, which was actually save us. Thank you, this side of the room. You're my favourite side of the room so far. No, I'm joking, guys. <laughs> but I want to look at today a little bit about um, the role of a mediator. Does anyone know what a mediator is? Not a media, a mediator. And a mediator is someone who will actually get in between to help to bring two parties together. Is anyone already thinking, oh, I can see where this is going? A couple of nods. But a mediator is someone who will help you to resolve an issue or if you're in trouble. Now, maybe you've ever been in trouble with the law or the courts or you have a dispute over a piece of property or maybe it's a will and you've ever had to invoke the assistance of a mediator. You've had someone who helped to bring two parties together to resolve an issue. And Jesus is, is a mediator in this sense. It says here in 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He is our mediator. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for, for what Chris shared about the chasm, and the, the more that we actually pull and lean on that anchor that is Jesus Christ, the tighter He holds onto us. And, and I love that. I used to hear this story. Um, back in Bible college, it was quite funny. Um, and one of my favourite lecturers of all time was a, a, a guy by the name of Dr. David Parker. And he is brilliant. He's a, a world-renowned scholar. He, he leads the... He is actually... I think he's one of the world's leading scholars in, in Luke and Acts. He, he, um, he breaks that down really well. He's, he's brilliant. But I remember him preaching one day about how there is man over one side of the chasm and then there's God over the other side of the chasm and then God reaches out to man and then man reaches back out to God and it's like a bridge. And ever heard the terminology of when you're building a bridge, you would have a pin that would drop in between the steel anchors that would hold the bridge together. It's called a lynch pin. Has anyone ever heard of the lynch pin before? When you've got a bridge coming from one way and this is what they used at the Sydney Harbour Bridge. They would build a bridge from, started from one side and when it got to the middle, they would drop these steel pins in. And the whole concept was is that Jesus was the linchpin that held the bridge together. And, and people were sitting there going, oh, this is fabulous. This is wonderful. This is fantastic. And then he dropped the bomb. And he says, you've got to forget about that. That's basically heresy. When you think about Jesus being the linchpin that just holds it all together because Jesus isn't the linchpin, he's the whole bridge. Because mankind in itself didn't ever reach out to God. Jesus is the whole thing. He is the only reason. He's the only way in which we have relationship with God. He is our mediator. He's everything. So, but in the Old Testament, there's three different types of mediators that acted between as a go-between between God and man. You've got the prophet, you've got the priest, and you've got the king. And this was even evident in the Garden of Eden. And Adam himself actually acted as each of these things because we know from Scripture that Adam is a type or a, um, a, a forebearer of Jesus. And we can actually look at Adam and see that some of the things that Jesus did. Je Adam was the, the, he's the, he's the first Adam. Jesus was the, the last Adam, the perfect rendition of what God had intended. Now, and he, you know, he, had a, he was a prophet in the fact that he had true knowledge of God, and he always spoke truthfully about God and about his creation. He was 
a priest in that he was able to freely and openly to offer prayer and praise to God. And he was a king in the sense that he was given dominion and rule over all of creation. So Adam actually fulfilled all of these three roles in the garden, prophet, priest, and king. All right, I need a bit of a, I need a volunteer. I need some, I need some volunteers. And I'm, I'm, I'm still working out in my head how exactly I'm going to do this. But I need, I need a prophet. Who wants, who, who's feeling prophetic today? Jaden's feeling prophetic. Come on up here, Jaden. Come and stand over here. No. Well, the thing is this. If you keep putting your hand up for every single question that I ask in church, you're going to get called out sometime or another. So stand right there. Face that way. Fantastic. Now, I'm going to need a priest. Who, who wants to be a priest? Oh, yes, right up in the back corner. Come on up. Lexi, come on down, Lexi. Very good. All right. And now you can stand right. I think you can stand up there because you're a little bit. Sh- that's better, isn't it? That's good. All right. Now we need a king. Who's feeling royal today? Someone's feeling very <laughs> royal and regal. Cody. <laughs> come on. Come and stand right here, Cody. All right, so we've got our prophet, we've got our priest, and we've got our king. All right, now we need one more. We need one more person. We need one more. Now, this is the most spiritual role of all. I need someone to play God. Someone to play God. Yes, Tommy Hobbs. Hey, I'm just, I'm just glad Tommy put his hand up. He doesn't like the spotlight, but he's coming. Come on, Tommy. All right, Lexi, I'm going to get you to come and stand down here. I'm actually going to get Tommy to stand up there, not because he's short, but because I want to show you, I'm going to demonstrate something. Come and stand right up the front there, Jaden. Fantastic. Now, what are you? You are? You're the prophet. You're the prophet. Cody, come and stand up the front here. You're the king, and you are the priest. Okay, so this is, this is the way that the relationship works, is that the prophet stood always with his back to God, this is God over here, he's looking chill, yeah. with his back to God, speaking God's words to the people. Okay, so do we understand that? That's the role of the prophet. The prophet, he is from God with his back to God, speaking God's word to the people. Now, the priest was different. The priest had his back to the people speaking the requests and petitioning for the people to God. Can you see the the, the difference here? The prophet speaks to the people. The priest speaks to God. Takes the petitions of the people, the wounds of the people, speaks to God. Now, the difference over here with the king, the king is is different. It has a a kind of a dual purpose in in one sense, but the, the king kind of sometimes will fulfill some of those roles, but the king is responsible for this. This is God's law. The king's responsibility and primary responsibility was to uphold and make sure that the law, God's law, was being managed and being maintained and being throughout the kingdom. That was the role of the king. So you have these three different offices. You've got a prophet who will hear from God and speak God's word out to the people. You'll hear, have the priest who will hear from the people and then partition to God in the Holy of Holies, and offer sacrifices. And then you have the king who goes, well, I've got God's law in my hand, and I'm going to make sure that all of you actually comply. Have we got a bit of a picture of those three roles of the the mediators in the Old Testament? Great. All right, you can give these guys a hand. They can go and sit down. Well done, Tommy. You you can can keep that one, Cody. You might need it. (laughs) Just being cheeky. Cody is a man of the word. So the thing with those, those, those different analogies and those roles is that Jesus in himself, this is the, in the Old Testament, but Jesus in himself not only came to fulfill the law, but he came to fulfill all three of those roles. He is our perfect prophet. He is our perfect priest. And he is our king. He actually fulfills all three of those roles like Adam did, but Jesus now fulfills all three of those roles. Are we we getting the picture here? Great. Okay, 
So I'm just skipping a few of these scripture verses back down there um, because I've I've just skipped a whole bunch of my notes. I'm really sorry, Um, Levi. Fantastic. Great. So I'm not going to lose a lot of these um, this morning. All right. So let's have a look at um, John chapter 16 and John chapter 6 and verse 15. So we have the Old Testament. The, the king has the authority to rule over the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus was born to be the king of the Jews. Uh, but he refused any attempt by the people to make him an earthly king with earthly military and political power. It was not in his thing. So Jesus says this. He says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force. Imagine that. You're just standing there, you're doing your own thing, and a group of people going, well, you're going to be our king. I'm going to come and take you by force to, to be that. Jesus said that, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And then he says in John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus is trying to build the picture here that he's not only a prophet, he's not only a priest, but he's a king, but not the king that everybody expects. See, the nation of Israel, and I think I've repeated this a thousand times, were expecting someone to come and deliver them from their political oppression and the, the rulership that had happened with the Romans. They were looking for someone to come and deliver them from their natural circumstance, from their physical oppression. But Jesus said, I, my kingdom is not of this world. There's something more at play and I've come to be king, but not the king as you expect. Hebrews 1, 1 1-4 says, Long ago, and this is how we can get a really, really good picture of this. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed to the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making the purification For sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent as as theirs. And the key thing there, the key positional thing that places Jesus above every other name is those words, sat down. When Jesus sat down next to the Father, that was seated in a throne room, kingly. He was placed as king and anointed as king. You know, when, when Christ came, we saw for the first time the fulfillment of all of the three of these roles, prophet, priest, and king, since he was perfect prophet, because he who most fully declared God's words to us, the perfect high priest who offered the supreme sacrifice. And remember in the Old Testament, the priest would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. Jesus offered himself as the perfect and supreme sacrifice for sins and who brought his people near to God, the true and rightful king of the universe who will reign forever over the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus is king. We've got to establish that. Jesus isn't just a a saviour. He is the saviour. He isn't just a king. He is the king. And we need, to, we need to position ourselves with the way that we think and the way that we, we, we act. Sure, are there other kings? But Jesus is the king, the king of kings. He rules and reigns over it all. And when we understand that, when we establish that, we get a bigger picture of who Jesus is. And that is the whole primary purpose of us talking about this over the last couple of weeks. We need to have an understanding of who Jesus really is And the the thought today is that Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord as well. The only difference between the kingdom today and the kingdom that we will know in the future is visibility. It's the visibility. It's the only thing that we can see. Jesus is King right now and He holds the highest government office in the universe because He has been elevated to that position 
by God. He has been placed as king. See, back in the Old Testament, back in when Jesus was on the earth, they tried to take him by force to make him king, but that wasn't their role, their right, or their job. It was God's job, God's role, God's right. And he placed him as king. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. God has positioned Jesus in that highest place of honour, seated at his right hand. So we can see how there's a complete parallel in the Old Testament structures and offices that mediated between God and Israel. Now we've got Jesus who completes and fulfills and perfects each one of these positions because we need a prophet. We need someone who is going to hear from God and speak God's words to the people. We need a priest, someone who's going to hear from the people and petition to God. And we need a king, someone who's going to actually enforce and enact the law of God. And we need those three roles. Now, I can't fulfill that. I can, I, can, I can work my best to try and hear from God and God's word and speak that to you and I can try and petition, but I can't fulfill these things. This is not my function. This, I'm, I'm a pastor. My, my, my job is to shepherd, is to guide, is to teach God's word responsibly. But I can't be all these things. This is why Jesus exists. Jesus came. Jesus is all of these three things. He's our perfect prophet, perfect priest, perfect king. So... With this in mind, I want us to look a little bit closer at this thing we call the Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Christ. And it's in effect his rule and his reign. And, and, and what he is responsible for. And I want to throw a couple of things out today. And uh, this is not a big rah-rah message. I'm not trying to get everybody to stand up and clap. And I'm not going to shout the house down. I think God wants to do something different today. Uh, I, I want, I want to, to look at his rule and the disruption of his rule, and the conquest of Christ within that. So to truly understand the lordship of Christ here within the earth, we got to go back in time, back into history. And we talked about this a lot in our GROW course that we just did on Christology, which was, I thought was brilliant. But that's not for me to say because I was teaching it. But... It was actually really good. It was a great time. I learned so much and the people who came and attended it learned a lot out of it and got a lot out of it. And learning things out of the scripture that you just, you don't get like every day. You can, you can kind of look at something and look at something and then something else gets shone a light on it and you, you just go, oh, I never even thought about it that way before. And that's what GROW does. That's why we, we do those things. So we've got to go back in the original situation. And we've got to understand the design that God had for mankind. So we've got to establish that Adam, Adam was designed with these three roles in mind. You know, um, and then the nation of Israel related to God through prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is a fulfillment of these roles. But I want to look at this, this term back in the garden. We've got to go back into the garden. We've got to look at what Adam did. We've got to look at the, the understanding. And we've got to under, look at the word dominion. Because it says in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So this word dominion, it means to rulership, ownership, it's kind of where we get our, our terminology and the, the root word for dominate comes from. We were called to dominate. Now, has anybody seen the new Jurassic Park movie? Yeah. Right. Now, you should never go to movies as a Christian. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's called dominion. Uh, it, it, they do actually a little bit of an explanation of this about how mankind is losing dominion in the earth and, and bowing to creation. Um, and, and this is not the way things are. Adam was created in God's image and he was given dominion. He was made by God. Adam, let's get this right. Adam was made by God, the Lord of all creation. He was made to have dominion over it. He was created as the ruler over it and he was given the responsibility and the authority to be able to enact out that dominion. Okay, so we've got that 
base established. Is everybody in agreement? Yes. Good. They've got some nods. It's great. And then comes along Satan. Sneaky little snake. And then he starts to whisper in Eve's ear and starts to challenge a few things. So you've got to remember Adam's role. Designated by God, Lord of creation, Lord of the earth, Lord of all of the birds in the sea, birds in the sea, <laughs> birds in the air, the fish in the sea. Yes, th- th- thank you, Lisa. I'll, I'll get it right one of these days. But if you didn't make mistakes and silly things, then you wouldn't have any silly clips to go back on and make funny videos out of, would you, Sammy? So Satan comes along in the form of a serpent to convince Eve that not only that they could be lords of the earth, but that they could be lords of heaven and earth as well. So you've got to understand there's a separation in realms, heaven and earth. So who's the lord of the heaven? God. Who's the lord of the earth? Designated by God, Adam. But Satan comes along, who had already been kicked out for trying to rebel and usurp God's authority in heaven to try and convince man who had been designated as Lord of the earth that they could have more than what God had already given them. All right? Are we following? Great. Because it gets a bit tricky. So then this thing happens called sin. This thing happened that comes in called sin, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 it says, For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So you've got this picture here, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I want to make sure that we understand it and explain it a little bit because. Everybody knows that in the Garden of Eden, when mankind fell, it was the woman's fault. Right? Yeah, come on. That's what we all say. But that woman that you gave me, yeah? But that's what the Bible teaches, is that the woman that you gave me. No, so I want to I point out a difference here in what happened with Adam and Eve in this moment. Eve was deceived by the serpent. But Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam deliberately chose disobedience. He disobeyed God and that in itself was the gateway for sin to enter the world because Adam was not deceived and chose disobedience. Eve was deceived. She's like, well, this is the right thing for me to do because I can do it because this is what the the serpent told me. I've been sucked into this. But Adam was not deceived. He knew the truth. He knew what would happen. He knew the consequence, and yet he did it anyway. He did not, it was not deceived. So, and this is what happened here. In a moment, Adam and Eve, lords of the earth, which were gifted by God, stopped believing the word of God and started instead believing the word of Satan. And this is what happened in that that instant. When, I, when, when mankind disobeyed God's word, they stopped believing that God's word was true and started believing the word of the enemy instead. Therefore, in that instance, there is a transference of authority. There's a transference of power. They took the gift. So to obey the word of Satan is to acknowledge him as Lord. Now, what I'm trying to build a picture here. They took the gift that God gave them and handed it to Satan. So mankind, designated by God to be Lord of the earth, goes, well, righto, I'm going to try and take this the same way that Satan took that, tried to take it before and got kicked out. I've now transferred my power to him because I believed his word over God's word. All right, I'm stepping into some dangerous territory here. Everyone's really quiet. It's good. So they took the gift that God gave him and handed it to Satan, and he is now known as the God of this world. It even says this in Scripture. Luke 4, 5 or 6, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me. 
he's referring back to that first instance back in the garden where Adam actually gave Satan the authority and the rulership that God had gifted to him. Are we actually are we understanding this picture? Right, good. Satan had already tried to take what wasn't his in rebellion against God and was cast out of God's presence. So he stole and deceived his way into being the Lord of earth by thievery. This is the big thing. So you can understand going back to Scripture and you can see the Scripture points out to things. It tells stories. It references other Scriptures. The New Testament references the Old Testament so much. And in this passage, John 10, 10, when it talks about the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief is the reference to this transference of power where the devil stole the authority that was not his, but it was actually designated to mankind. We were created to be the lords of creation. That was what Adam's role was. Adam, created to be lord of creation, handed over power, and now the lord over all of that creation and the world was Satan. So mankind found itself in bondage under the rule of an evil lord. So you can see how this transference has actually played out throughout history, right? Mankind and oppression and different rulership and evil kings comes under the authority of what Satan had. For man to be redeemed and, and actually restored from this position of actually losing their, um, their lordship over creation, Satan, the lordship of Satan had to be overthrown. And God sent his son to reestablish the kingdom of God on earth. This is what Jesus preached. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and he proceeded to overthrow the kingdom of Satan so that the kingdom of God could be established. This is what happened. The kingdom of God was established. All that Adam had lost, Jesus came to regain and not just for himself, but for as many as who receive him. There's another kingdom. There's another kingdom. And this is the picture that I am trying to, to build. We do not have to. We do not have to live under the rulership of the Lord of this world any longer because there is an alternative kingdom. And we can actually bow to its king, Jesus Christ, and receive him as Lord. And we can be in the kingdom of heaven. This is what God has done. But let's have a look really quickly at the temptation of Jesus in the desert because this right here in Scripture is the battle for lordship. This is the battle for, this is the battle for, um, for, for total rulership. It was happening right here in this moment. Jesus recognised his Father as Lord. And Jesus lived and moved according to his Father's word. He was fully submitted. He was fully committed to his Father. This is the difference, and this is the exact same kind of thing that happened back in the Garden of Eden, is that the enemy came to try and tempt Jesus, to try and deceive Jesus into handing over what was rightfully his. See, Jesus came, but he wasn't subject to the rulership of the Lord of this world. He was subject to the rulership of his Lord, his Father. And Satan tried to attack Jesus' identity as the Son of God because he constantly is saying throughout the temptation, if you are the Son of God, it's like he doubted it for some way or he's trying to put things in Jesus' head. You know, Satan had no power over Jesus because there was no sin in Jesus' life. That was completely broken. Adam handed over lordship to Satan because he listened to Satan. However, Jesus only listened and acted on the word of the Father. Now, maybe I've gone a little bit complicated today. Maybe you're going to, go to have to go back and listen to this one again. I'm thinking I'm probably going to have to as well. But I think it's a good idea that we actually get this picture. We actually understand this concept that mankind, Adam, when, we, when sin entered into the world, we lost what God had created us to have. God had created us with a Dominion. He had created us with authority. He created us with rulership and lordship over creation. And in a moment, in the first instance of deception, that was handed over. And it took Jesus to come 
to redeem us to our rightful state. So Adam handed over lordship because he listened to Satan. However, Jesus only listened and acted to the word of the Father. John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. In every detail, the difference between Adam and Jesus was that Jesus only sought to glorify the Father. He only sought to glorify the Father. And Adam was deceived into trying to glorify himself. Adam was deceived into thinking, well, hang on, I've been created Lord of the, he- or Lord of the earth, but you're saying to me that I can have the Lordship over heaven as well. I can actually be like God, but he was already made in God's image. So it was, it was a sin of pride. But when Jesus came, sent from the Father to break Satan's hold, a Lord over the, he breaks Satan's hold as Lord over the fallen state of mankind, to accomplish this, Jesus had to break the power of death. He had to break the power of death. Satan had used sin to bring death and the certainty of a lost eternity to the human race. But Jesus came to give righteousness and life and the promise of eternity in heaven. This is what Jesus did. Jesus turned it all around. On the cross, Jesus declared to a holy God that man was paying the debt of his sin and to Satan he virtually said, the debt is paid, your hold is broken. This is what happened on the cross when Jesus went on the cross. Hebrews 2 verse 14 to 15 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. This act of, this, this act of obedience, this act that Jesus did, that he went to the cross, that he went through that valley of death, he went through death itself, to defeat it. This act of obedience is the exact counteract to Adam's disobedience. And we can see this through Scripture. We can see this as the picture that God paints through one man's disobedience, sin entered the world, that through one man's obedience, we can now have relationship with God again. And this is what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. Romans 5.19, I just read that out loud. There you go. When scripture just comes to you, but I forget the references. Does anyone ever do that? Can, I, can we have an honest pastor moment for a second? I, I remember scripture. I remember what the word of God says. I don't remember where it says it. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I think Google has a lot to do with that. I blame Google. Because all the information is now stored in your pocket. And you're going, well, I don't have to remember where that was. I got the gist of it. Oh, there it is. Does anybody, confession time in church. Who else does this? Online, put your hand up. Okay, I'm thinking that's a good 50. It might the rest of you. The other 50%, you guys are spiritual. <laughs> you're good. Georgia, would you mind coming back and softly playing the keys? I don't know where we're going today. I don't know where this is going to end, but I'm going to wrap this up right now. And through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are now made right with God, and he restores us to a place of victory. See, we handed over authority. So the thing is, I say we because we're lumped in this humanity together. We're lumped in this all together. Even though it was Adam who sinned, it's all part of all of us because Adam is a representation of humanity. He's a representation for all of us. And because he sinned, we all now are born into sin. Through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we are now made right with God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what happened. And I'm going to try and summarize this whole message in about a couple of sentences. God created man to have dominion and authority, created them as Lord over over all of earth, over all of creation. But man, in his 
pride and arrogance, tried to be like God, which He was already like, to try and take authority over heaven and on earth, which wasn't His role. And sin entered the world. But through Jesus... Through Jesus' obedience, through our disobedience, sin entered the world. Through Jesus' obedience, He came and He conquered the hold of Satan over this world and over all of the sin of mankind. See, yet before, we could not but sin because we were caught in sin. We had no choice. It was Lord over us. But when Jesus came, He broke the power of sin and death. Now we have a new Lord. We are no longer subjects to this world. We are subjects to the kingdom. This is making sense to anyone. Jesus broke the power of Satan and the hold that he has. So Jesus' final and eternal position is this. He's been given the ultimate position of lordship and he's placed in a higher place. Ephesians tells us that all things are under His feet. Philippians 2 says that, Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We were talking a second ago about the battle of the Lordship for the earth. Satan had control, but Jesus not only wrested back control, He has now been placed as Lord over heaven, Lord over earth, Lord of all things under the earth. They are under His feet and under His control. I love that Scripture in verse 10 of Philippians 2, verse 10. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, sometimes we just stop there. and We go, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. And we skip something that's really important about the Lordship of Jesus and His position. We've got to, we've got to come back to this. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven. All of heaven bows to Jesus. And on earth, everything on earth which is this earthly realm that we see, the stuff that we see with our eyes, the stuff that we experience with our bodies, the stuff that we happens to us day to day on earth and under the earth. Now, what does that represent? That represents the spiritual realm that Satan always controlled. Under the earth. It's a representation but Jesus has now been made Lord over all of it. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess. His name is the only name that we should bow to. His name is the only way that we should drop a knee to. So how do we, because the Lordship of Satan has been broken, the Lordship of Christ has been established. Jesus is now able to establish the kingdom of God on earth of which He is now the Lord. So how do we change our allegiance? How do we go, well, this is what I've always known. This is what I am under. How do I change my allegiance? How do I follow this new King? Because we once knowingly or unknowingly submitted ourselves to the Lordship of Satan that says for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The only way in which we can now change allegiance to follow Jesus is to confess Christ as Lord. The Bible makes it really simple. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 8, what does it say? The Word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We established last week, and if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to listen to the message. Why do we need to be saved and what were we being saved from? This is the picture. We now can change our allegiance from being followers of darkness to being followers of the light. We can actually walk in that because of what Christ has done. So it says in verse 10, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. 
That's our job. We get to respond to Jesus as Lord. Why don't we stand to our feet? It says really clearly in that last scripture, confess and believe. Confess and believe. Confess and believe. Those two things go hand in hand. They can't be separated from one for the other. Because if you're confessing something that you don't believe, it doesn't work. And if you're believing something in your heart, but you don't confess it, it also does no power. We don't just believe in our heart. We need to confess with our mouth. I believe honestly that the transference of ownership of our lives happens when we believe in our heart the Word of God and we speak the Word of God over our lives. That's what happens. So this morning, I want to ask you today, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I think that as a church, together, this is what we're going to do. We're going to confess. We're going to believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord, but we're going to confess in His name. Amen. All right, why don't we close our eyes and let's pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, today, I acknowledge Your rightful place as Lord, not just of this earth, but heaven and all things under the earth. But Lord, today, there's another kingdom that needs to submit to You. And that's the kingdom of my heart. So today, I confess that You are Lord of my life, that You died and You rose again to bring me victory. And now I can say, I am a citizen of the Kingdom of Heaven. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen, Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise in this place? Thank You, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, can we just sell it? Can we worship Him for a second? We glorify You, Lord. We magnify You. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're exalted and lifted high. We praise the name of Jesus. Jesus, You're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of all glory, all honour, all power and all strength be to Your name, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. Jesus. 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 Sarabasiti Arutadiata. Father, we submit. We're going to close the service in just one second. I feel I've got to be obedient to something. We're we're not going to have a closing song today. I know some of you love that. I think God wants to say something to us in this moment. I, I don't know about I don't know about you guys, um, and it's hard as a church pastor. You kind of you, you find this you, you find this bit challenging to talk about because I kind of want everybody to be as passionate as I am about the things of Christ and the things of God and the Word. I want everybody to have that same desire and that same passion and same, like, I'll do anything. I want to come and follow Jesus. And in different ways people do, but it's hard to separate the physical, what you see from what you actually is going on in people's lives. But I'm desperate for revival. I'm passionate about seeing God's Spirit move. I want the lost 
to come into a knowledge and an understanding of God's kingdom because this is the mission of our church is not so that we can come together on a Sunday and just be encouraged around a a nice message and, and some fellowship and a free coffee. That's not our mission. Our mission is to proclaim the gospel to a lost and a dying world. And our world is broken and it needs Jesus. And I'm desperate for this. I want this to happen. But every single great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in revival has come at the price of repentance. We have got to come. We have got to sort out our mess. We've got to let the Holy Spirit clean us out. We've got to come before God with repentance daily. If we confess, and I'm not suggesting that we actually put a box up in the corner and we have confession time. That's just awkward. And seriously, I don't want those problems. But what I'm saying is that if we are desperate and we seriously want God to move within our midst, to move within our community and see this region saved for His glory and see the kingdom of God advance, we have got to get on our knees before Him and say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. I come to you with a clean hands and pure heart. Work in me. Breathe in me. Move in me so that I might speak to others. Anyway, that's a whole nother message. Can we get desperate together? Older people. I spoke to the young people last week. There's a lot of you in this church who've been here from the day it began and were in church for generations before that. We've got a lot to hand over. We've got a lot to pass on. Don't think that just because we've hit a certain age that our time's finished and it's someone else's time to take up the mantle. I remember a pastor, Tommy Evans, just wanting to be desperate to see more people come into the kingdom. He was well into his 90s. Just wanted to see more people come into the kingdom. Father, we just pray over every single person here in this place today that you would just burn in our hearts afresh like you've done today. Teach us your word. Teach us to know you. Move us from a place of partial commitment to total commitment, that we would serve you with our lives. In Jesus' name. Why don't you stretch forward your hands. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Harvest Church, let's see revival come.